Susan Kane, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kathy. Um, I was telling you right before we hit record that uh, I've been a fan of yours for a while, as so many of us are. And it's interesting because I first discovered your work um, from all about, you know, your TED Talk, your first, you know, sort of book about being quiet and introverted. And it's interesting because my husband is very much introvert and I'm very much, much an extrovert. And unfortunately, just being honest about my own shortcomings, there was a season in our marriage where I was thinking that he was sort of in his own way and that I could sort of help him if he mm -hmm. could just be more extroverted. Mm -hmm. And it was only until, honestly, it helped our marriage so much um, because I first discovered you and I read this book, Quiet, and he read it. And I was like, oh, I get it. Like he's really in alignment with who he is. And I mean, thankfully I got the, the message and that was now, it's been like, we've been married, we've been together 16 years. I think we read that well, we got married in 2009. You, the book came out in 2012. So it helped a lot. So I just want to say thank you. Oh my gosh. That's so amazing to hear. And was it like, was he the one saying, please read this so you can understand me? Or did somebody hear about your marital like, he, misunderstandings? And no, he found it first and said, mm -hmm. maybe if you just read this, you would understand. So let's oh. start there because I feel like that's where a lot of this begins. Um, what is it that got you to a point of wanting to put that message in the world? Oh, the quiet message. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think like all my messages, the same with, with, um, my new book, bittersweet too. Um, they all come from a sense of, um, me having a very like, uh, deep and strong perception about something that is happening in the world that is not getting talked about. Um, you know, some, something kind of like deep in the soul yeah. that, uh, that there are no words to articulate. There's no language for them. And that's to me, the only point of writing a book, like, you know, if you're writing about something that everyone already knows and has been talking about, you wouldn't bother. But like at the time that I started writing quiet, um, you know, I was always somebody, who, uh, I was very interested. I, I used to be a corporate lawyer in my old life, which is so strange, but I was, um, and you know, I was always the person in the firm who was sitting on every committee that had to do with the so-called soft skills, you know, like we had the women's working group in, in those days, and we had uh, the professional development committee and all this. And I thought, well, this is all good, but the, the hidden dynamic that's shaping everything has to do with this question of temperament um, and how we show up at meetings and negotiations and the different ways that we interact with each other. And there was no there was no committee for that because there was no language for talking about those things. So that's why I wrote the book. Um, wow. That's so interesting. I love how you kind of get to the heart of the matter and really address the temperament of people in negotiation. I mean, it's just, of course, right. It's like more than like what they're actually saying. It's like, how, how are they right. And, 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 and then what really gets heard in the room. So let's just talk about it for a second. Cause it seems a little bit like a, um, what's the word? Like, I hate, I don't know. The word oxymoron sounds like a silly word, but I feel like it's, a, it feels like that when somebody is like you, like, you know, you do Ted talks, you're all around the world, you're writing books and yet you're an introvert. So clearly they can go together. How can you help us make sense of that? How can you be someone who's who prefers to sort of be in a certain, you know, sense quiet, but then you can also choose to not be quiet. Like, how does that look? How does that work for you? Well, I mean, being an introvert is really just about having a preference for environments where you have kind of fewer inputs coming in at you at any one time, you know, you kind of, you, you have a nervous system that literally functions at its best. Um, when you're in an environment that's quieter and mellower because your nervous system gets overstimulated when too much is coming at it. And for extroverts, it's the opposite liability. Um, an extrovert has a nervous system that is functioning at its best when there are a lot of things happening. So for extroverts, the liability is if there's not enough hubbub around you, you start to feel kind of listless and, and disengaged and sluggish. Um, so for an introvert, 
you know, if you're somebody like me and you really prefer like your moments of quiet sanctuary and you prefer socializing one-on-one -on -one and that kind of thing, um, that's, yes, that's when I'm in, in my sweet spot, but that doesn't mean that if I have an idea to share, let's say that I don't want to go out and give a talk about it or, um, you know, interact with people about it. It, it, it will mean that when, let's say, if I'm on stage, I am very much not in my sweet spot at that moment. Um, but, but I still have the same desire to mm -hmm. share ideas. And, you know, that's, that's my line of work for somebody yep. else. It's going to be a different line of work. Um, but, you know, I, I have the desire to accomplish my goals, let's say, the same desire that anybody else does. Um, yeah. and, and so I'm just aware that there are certain moments when I'm in my sweet spot and certain that makes sense. when I'm not. And yeah. Um, yeah, and and I, I really do think that the like the way to live best in general is to be aware of when, when you're in the sweet spot and when you're not, and to make sure that you give yourself time to recharge. Um, yeah. Let, and not beat yourself up. When yeah. You do feel uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. I think a lot of people do beat themselves up for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I think that there is an idea that in order to be successful, we have to be extroverted. We have to go live on Instagram. We have to like it. We have to sell. We have to do things that put us in situations where people feel there's a value on being extroverted. And in this first book, and obviously we're going to talk about your new book, but in just as a, we're going through this journey in the first book, you talk about, there's like this sort of inherent undervaluing of people who are introverted and that there's somehow a you know, a gold star given to people who are happily extroverted. Can you talk about that a little bit and how maybe somebody who's introverted can understand that there's value in how they show up and that they could still be successful, even with the fact that they're not necessarily an extrovert? Yeah. I mean, I, I came from a family of introverts. Um, and I mean, I'll, and, and it was very clear to me because of the family that I grew up in that the things that members of my family had contributed to the world that I most admired were contributions that they had made because of their quiet, introverted temperaments, not in spite of them. So I'll just give you one example. Of my, Please. Like my father was a truly amazing and gifted doctor. He was a gastroenterologist and a medical school prof um, professor. And he was the guy you would come to if, um, you know, his fellow doctors would come to if they couldn't figure out the, the proper diagnosis for a difficult case. He was the one who would figure it out. And the reason he could do that is because he was also the guy who would go to the medical conventions every year where they would tell you the latest breakthroughs. And he would sit quietly in the front row with like a tape recorder in those days, um, a tape recorder and a notebook. He would take copious notes. Uh, um, and then he would listen to those tapes for hours afterwards over and over again until he had learned everything he needed to. And, you know, like he'd, he'd come home from work late at night and he, after dinner, he would go upstairs and pour over medical textbooks. And it's like, you can't act. There are things that you actually can't do as well. If you're not willing to put in the quiet and solitary and focused and heads down time. Um, and there are a lot of examples like this. And when I started looking around the world, you know, my, for my father, it showed up as a medical school professor, but in, in Quiet, I talk about Rosa Parks, for example, and the way that her, the, the form of protest that she chose was not an extroverted form of protest. Doesn't mean an extrovert couldn't have done it, of course, but she was exhibiting a kind of quiet strength that comes naturally to introverts. And there's a thousand examples like this that I could give you. So our culture, yes, talks about, uh, you know, that you should be out there and, and um, take charge and, uh, and assertive and enthusiastic and smiley and all these, all these uh, attributes that our culture most admires. But, and, and those are, I, I hasten to say, those are wonderful attributes. And like you, I'm married to an extrovert because I love those attributes. And I, I believe that introverts and extroverts bring out the best in each other and really admire each other naturally. Um, but those aren't the only attributes that are wonderful. And it, it's really that lopsidedness that I wrote quiet to correct. 
Oh my gosh. It's so beautiful. And I never thought, you know, I, I remember now that you give that example, but it's an important example because I, I don't associate Rosa Parks with being an introvert. I, I, I think that that's really, really astounding to think about how there's so much power in a quiet form of strength like that. And um, yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, no, I was just going to say about Rosa Parks. I actually, I remember exactly where I was at the moment that the news that she had passed away came over the radio airwaves. I remember exactly where I was standing. And I remember what those first news reports said, you know, and they talked about her having been um, short of stature and quiet. And I think they used the word timid in some of them. Um, and I remember being shocked at the moment at that time, because at that time I had not realized what her temperament was like. And I, like everybody else, um, had imagined that, you know, to do what she did, she must have been, I don't know, I had imagined her as, you know, like a, a tall, physically imposing, um, uh, outwardly strong person, you know, I, I, the people said of her that she, something like she was small with the courage of a lion, something like that. But I had imagined somebody who presented as a lion outwardly yeah. too. Yeah. And I was, and that was one of those real, um, you know, kind of shake your worldview moments when those first reports came over, over the rave waves, over the, the radio waves. And I started thinking, you know, what else can quiet do that we don't give it credit for? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So as people are, you know, you mentioned before that certain things when you're introverted are just like, it's a lot for the nervous system, but you have a very, you know, big career and you, like you said, you have a message that you, you have a desire to get out there. So just to give a little bit of um, guidance to introverts, like, when they are stepping into something that, that they desire to do, and it will require that their nervous system might get sort of, I mean, some probably times overstimulated, what advice do you have so that they can still show up and feel like they can tolerate it, or maybe even learn to like it when it's not necessarily their comfort zone? The biggest thing is that you need to organize your life around what the psychologist Brian Little calls your core personal projects. Um, so the, the people, the work, the causes that matter the most to you, because in the service of those causes, those projects, it's much easier to step outside your comfort zone than if you're doing it out of, you know, some sense of obligation that you don't love. But then even once you are doing those core personal projects, to really become aware of when you're in your comfort zone and when you're not, and to structure your day incredibly mindfully. Um, you know, so people often say to me, as you just did, um, you know, you have this big career and you're out there doing all these seemingly extroverted things. And that's true. But if you saw the way my workday and my life actually looks, um, I very carefully schedule it so that the vast majority of that time is spent much more in sanctuary spaces, I would call it, um, you know, like quietly writing or working on projects or with my family or um, doing yoga, hiking, like those kinds of things. And even now I'm in the middle of, um, of launching a new book that I have devoted the last five, six, seven years of heart and soul to. And even then I will only do you know, two interviews a day, let's say, because mm -hmm. every so often I'll do more, but, but mostly not because yeah. I'm really careful about it. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's beautiful to hear somebody who's gone, you know, many steps down the road who can say, and I love that, you know, you added the, the, the projects that you really care about. Right. Cause I think when people have a sense of purpose attached to things, right? It changes the way that we view them. Um, so last question about this piece, which is, I had read that before you did this TED talk, which by the way, became just so, so beloved by so many people. Um, I even heard that Bill Gates was saying like, it was his favorite TED talk of all time, which is, you know, not a small thing, but I had read that you had like feelings of overwhelm before you gave this talk. And so many of our listeners 
feel this feeling of dread or it feels scary, right? It feels scary to do certain things. I know I've definitely felt that way. Sometimes I'm asked to do things that feel just outside of my comfort zone, like speak to 2000, 3000 people live. And I'm like, you know what? I think it's really not a good time to travel or, you know, I think like I'll come up with like excuses because I'm just plain old scared. Um, how, how did you overcome that? And how do you suggest that when somebody feels scared, and this could be for introverts and extroverts, that when somebody feels scared or that feeling of like imposter syndrome or overthinking how we're going to come across or just how do you um, suggest that people might reapproach that so that we can do things that feel a little bit out of our, out of our comfort zone? Yeah. Well, I mean, I will say with that TED talk, <laughs> overwhelm would be the understatement of the century. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> I was flat out terrified, like totally terrified. And I don't even think I would have given that TED talk if my husband, I, I, I filled out like the application or whatever I had to do for TED back then. Um, I don't think I would have done it if my husband hadn't just sat me down and made me do it. And I think he was the one who like put the thing into the mailbox. I'm quite sure without him, I never would have given that talk. Um, Because I, like, as you were just saying, I found a thousand reasons why I didn't really have time to fill out the application or whatever it was. Right. Um, So how did you then, how did you reaffirm that you were going to and do it like without being so, so scared that you threw up? Well, I mean, once they actually invited me to do it, like I, I understood that it was one of those grand opportunities, opportunities of my life. Um, so, and, and seriously, I was so scared. Okay. Here's the thing. <laughs> um, the way to get over any fear is to expose yourself in small doses to the thing you're afraid of. That's been well established in psychology. Yeah. So I, I had spent the previous year taking classes for people with public speaking anxiety, where all you really had to do on the first day was like stand up and say your name and sit back down and, you know, declare victory and you're done. Um, And little by little, like you actually can overcome from there, but I was not ready yet for something as grand as a Ted talk. I, so again, with my husband's help, he actually found a local drama coach, um, And I sat with that drama coach. His name is Jim Fife, F-Y-F-E. He is amazing. He now has coached many other TED speakers besides me since then, um, F-Y-F-E. And I sat with him for a week before that talk every day, all day long. So it was like 40 hours (laughs) of working with Jim Fife to get ready for this talk. And I'm telling you, he saw me in some dark moments. I was like, you know. At some points I was just like, I can't do this. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And then I don't know. And then I did, I still look back at that talk. I'm like, oh my God, I looked so nervous because since then I've now gone out and given a million talks and it's not as big a deal for me anymore. Um, and I gave another Ted talk about this new book and yes, I was nervous because everybody's nervous on the Ted stage, but it wasn't it wasn't terrifying the way it had mm. been the first time. So that's really what happens, you know, the yeah. only way, that, that adage of the only way, uh, what's what is it? the only way around the fear is through it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. It's true, but you can't start by giving a Ted talk. That's the thing. You really do have to start in small doses. That's the biggest advice that I have. Well, well it's very generous that you're so vulnerable about it. I think that that really helps people when they hear that even somebody like you, you know, can be candid about that. And I'm sure there were a, a zillion things that you got from him in that experience of leading up to it and then the 40 hours of working before. But if you could peel back one thing that you felt was the overarching gift of that time with him, what comes to your mind? The first thing first thing is that I said to him at the beginning, you know, I'm very comfortable talking with people one-on-one. I like, I really love to have deep, intimate talks. What I'm not comfortable with is being asked to be like a show person on stage because that's not who I am. And he said, okay, no big deal. Um, Let's sit on the couch with our, you know, legs curled up underneath us, which is like what I like to do. And um, let, you know, let's just sit on the couch and talk and tell me your talk just sitting. And that's how we did it. 
And that was the first foundational step to me to realizing that there's many different ways to give a speech. And to this day, my style is incredibly like intimate and conversational. It's not, I'm not going in to give a show. I'm going in to share with you something that I think really matters and to speak what I truly believe. And like just realizing that, oh, that's a valid form of public speaking too. You know, you don't have to be like the razzle dazzle actor yeah. person, which is not who I am. Um, that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. And I, I I haven't been live in any of your um, keynotes, but I can imagine that people probably love it because you're leaning in and it doesn't feel, there's a lack of, you know, a feeling of like an agenda or like something, even if you are rehearsed, which you probably are, I think it can feel a little bit more like you're present. I'm just guessing, although I'm sure that people, you know, who do a different style can also be really fantastic and leave everybody with their, their jaws drop. But I know for me, every time, and my producer, Emma, who's listening right now knows this, whenever I've like flown anywhere to give a speech at the last minute, even though they usually always insist that I have slides for me, this is just my style. Uh-huh. I always ask them at the end, if I cannot use the slides, because all I really want to do is not that. All I want to do is not do something that feels like I'm trying to get to a point to get to a point. I really just want to be in the room in that moment. And so usually at the very end, they've always said, fine. And it's the best because I just say, I'm here in this moment to talk to you guys and let's see what we need to talk about. And then it just works for me. Like everyone's different, but anyways, I can relate to that. So speaking of, um, important things that you want to get into the world. You just were sharing that you spent the last several years working on this new piece of work, um, which is called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Makes Us Whole. And it comes out very soon, April 5th, I believe. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's already been endorsed by Adam Grant and Glennon Doyle and Brene Brown. And I'm sure it's going to be something really important. So let's talk a little bit about why this book, it doesn't necessarily seem like the follow up to quiet. It seems like something a little bit different. Um, but why, why did you want to share this? Yeah. I mean, it's funny because on the surface, I suppose it is different from quiet, but there is a way in which it's similar in that it's also a book about hidden superpowers, um, that our culture doesn't endorse that our culture tells us to be afraid of and to stay away from, or that are Dis- supposedly distasteful in some way. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I believe that the, the bittersweet side of ourselves and um, our mm. ability to go to that place is one of our greatest pathways to creativity and connection and love. And yet, again, our culture tells us, don't go there. It's, uh, you know, you should be presenting your cheerful face at all times. Um, and this, I started exploring this, this has really been a kind of multi-year quest that I've been on at first to answer what seemed like a relatively small question. The question was, why do so many of us have such an intense reaction to sad music, an intensely positive reaction? You know, like, why do you love Adele? Um, someone like you, like that type of song. Um, for me, why do I love Leonard Cohen so much? I've loved him my whole life. And I, I kept having this experience that when I listened to sad music, um, my reaction was not sad at all. It was instead a reaction of, of joy and connection, um, a kind of like awe that the musician had managed to turn, to transform pain into beauty in this way. Um, and a feeling of connection with all the other people who had experienced the sorrow that this musician was now expressing, mm-hmm. all of this. And, um, and I started to wonder, what, what is that? And I found, that, I found out that um, people listen to the happy songs on their playlists 175 times, but they listen to the sad songs 800 times. Um, and they'll- Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and they, and they're, they know it, like, they know what it is. Like they'll tell researchers that, that those songs are connected to 
um, a sense of awe and transcendence and wonder, like psychologists call it the, the sublime emotions. So what is it about our ability mm-hmm. to go to that place that is connected to the highest states of humanity, you know, to awe and wonder and tra- transcendence? What is that? That was the question that I wanted to answer. Um, and uh yeah, and 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 so I, 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 I like I've talked to neuroscientists and psychologists, and I've been spending years looking at all the different wisdom traditions, and our artists and writers and philosophers have been trying to tell us this for centuries that this state of mind, this state of of longing and shared sorrow, is one of our highest states. Mm, that's so fascinating because you're right; we do seemingly live in a culture, and I think this is like this. Old- in a lot of places in the world. I've only lived in, I've lived in, I spent a semester in college in Spain. I lived in in Barcelona. Uh, And then after college, I went to Jerusalem for two weeks and then stayed for three years and (laughs) lived there. So I've never, that's where I've lived. I lived in Israel, Spain, and the United States, but there's definitely like a, a feeling of people want to feel good and have fun. Right. And, and, and it's like, there's so much more to us, you know, there's so much more to us. And I I do feel like I experienced that more here in in America that it's like, how are you? People are really not necessarily wanting to hear the whole story. It's more like, you're good, right? Good, good, good. You know, and then if you're not feeling good, why? Let's fix that. Um, And I did have that experience, I think more uh, living abroad that there was a little bit more of a space to entertain other kinds of feelings. Um, and that all things sort of had a, a season and that it was all okay. There wasn't one thing that was better than another. And I have had that feeling of what you're saying that even sometimes I've, I've been aware that I'm standing in a sad moment, even like recently we were at a funeral and yet it was like the most beautiful, meaningful experience. And so was I happy? No, but was I feeling a feeling of like deep alignment. I can't even, I don't even know what the word is. My soul, there was something about it that felt, I can't say bad, right? I don't know if the word is good, but whole, like alive, beautiful. So um, how do we, I guess, from your research and from your work and from what you as a, a human have experienced, how can we learn to then turn toward this and make space for being a whole human as opposed to rejecting all of those aspects of ourself and our feelings when clearly there's a part of us that identifies that we're actually feeling something beautiful when we feel that way. Well, I'm going to answer your question, but first I, the, the way you just described that funeral, I have to quote I have to read to you something from the book, from Bittersweet. And this is not my quote. This is actually something somebody else wrote that I included in the book. Um, And she's describing in this, in what I'm about to read to you, she's describing her grandfather's funeral and what she calls the quote, the union between souls that she experienced at this funeral. And she says, my grandfather's barbershop chorus sang him a tribute And for the first time in my 14 years, she had been 14 at the time, for the first time in my 14 years, I witnessed tears cascading down my father's face. That moment with with a lilting sound of men's voices, the hushed audience and my father's sadness is permanently etched on my heart. Um, and And then she goes on to say, when I think of these events, it's not the sadness that I most remember. It's the union between souls. When we experience sadness, we share in a common suffering. It's one of the, it's, it's a time when our culture allows us to be completely honest about how we feel. That like made me verklempt. That's like, that's so, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Yesterday we took the kids to Disney on ice and they sort of reenact, you know, snippets from all these classic um <laughs> Disney movies. So it's like a little bit of Little Mermaid, a little bit of Moana, a little bit of Cinderella and every time, I mean, leave it to Alan Menken to write every song that just like pulls your heart open directly, direct hit to the heart. But every, every single story, there is this 
yearning, right? And there's some obstacle and something very sad is in the way or happens or someone dies or somebody has to overcome something. And then there's a, there's a feeling of, of having like cared so much about someone else or cared so much about what you were put here to do. And then there's a, there's such a fulfillment, right? Because, because you actually somehow, some way make it through that moment. And it's amazing. And I'm crying through like the entire thing. And I'm thinking how much everybody is connected immediately to those movies, children and adults. And it's just really kind of interesting how I, I turned to my husband and like this, like all these stories name all the things that are the most resonant for all of us. Right. And that's why they become classics. Like, yeah, there might be a song you like on the radio, but does it sit with you? Does it stay with you? Like I can remember where I was the first time I heard a whole new world, right? Cause everyone's dreaming of that space where things just feel like you get out of that place where you feel stuck or you're not free or you, right. We all yearn for that place. So it's really interesting how we're constantly running from whatever those feelings are when really allowing them to be there in and of yeah. itself is satisfying. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I mean, yes, it, it, it's not, it's not an accident that all the stories that we love most, you know, the ones that have survived the test of time, all those stories, they start often with the protagonist as an orphan in some way, you know, like Harry Potter, orphan, um, Batman, orphan, Pippi Longstocking, orphan. It, there, there's something that the storytellers are telling us about the fact that these protagonists experienced brokenness before the story even begins. Um, because first of all, that is our state. Like we all do, we come into this world with a sense of belonging in some other world, you know, whether whether we're atheists or believers, it doesn't really matter. It's like the, the state of being human, the most fundamental aspect of ourselves is this deep feeling that we live in an extremely imperfect world and we belong in a different one from which we have mysteriously been banished. Like that's a, that's a fundamental feeling that we all have. And that's what these stories are telling us. And, you know, even if you look at um, a story like Homer, uh, the, uh, the Odyssey, and, and the figure of Odysseus, he's a very, you know, cunning and swashbuckling figure, but even for him, this, that, that whole odyssey, that story begins with him weeping on a beach out of homesickness for his native land, Ithaca. And the whole adventure gets going because he has to get back to Ithaca. It's the ultimate symbol for what all human beings feel that we have to somehow get back to the perfect and beautiful world from which we come and which we want to get, which we, which we yearn to attain. We're never exactly going to attain it, but there's something in the act of reaching for it that is our best selves. And that's where mm. creativity comes from. Um, and it's also where our ability to love and empathize with each other comes from. It comes from being in a shared state of exile. Um, and this is why I say like to, to live in a culture that's telling us not to talk about any of this. It's like, it's the ultimate robbing of our ability to really connect and to be our most creative selves. Um, Cause that's, that's what creativity so is. It's so beautiful. So many of those pieces, but that line you just said that in, in the pursuit of that, we like become our best selves, you know, like in reaching for that and that feeling of being in exile. I don't know. I'm, I know I'm harping on this point, but it just happened yesterday. It's so fresh in my mind, but there's a, there's a moment in this clip from Moana <laughs> where her grandmother says to her, um, Moana, do you know who you are? And I just like lost it. Cause she says, yeah, I'm a girl who loves this Island and I love these people. And I know that there's this place it's beyond the horizon and then she says, and this is not a dream that's out there. It's a calling and it's inside of me. Yeah. And I'm just like, I feel, and I don't think this is an overreach. I think every human being, there is something and it, 
It doesn't have to be that the, the whisper, the calling is that you're going to become the, the, the head of a country or whatever. It could be, the, it could be, there's degrees of what it is, but I think we all have this internal thing that's like, and it's inside of me. It's not out there. It's inside of me. And sometimes we actually push it off, but sometimes we decide to, 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 to turn toward it and to reach for it. And I think whether or not it, it winds up looking like what we thought it would look like or not, you're right. That in the pursuit of that, um, there's so much creativity and we do become so much of our best selves just as we, as we look to, to try to answer whatever that call is. And it, it is bittersweet, right? Cause there's something so deep in there. I'm curious for you, like you, Susan, like, what is that for you? Like, what do you want to leave people with in this book? But also like, what was that feeling for you? Like, since you were little, like, has it changed? Like, what is the thing that you're always feeling like? This is, this is what I'm hoping to, to do, to fix, to heal, to whatever it is. Oh, gosh. I mean, that's a big question. Um, and as I say, like, I feel it most intensely with music. Music just makes me, you know, puts me into that state right away. And sorry, I just want to say one thing before answering that question. When you talk about Moana, um, <laughs> like, in a way, that's the story of, um, of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz also, right? It's somewhere over the rainbow. Like, that's what somewhere over the rainbow is. It's, yeah. It's that state that we all, yeah. it's that place we all want to get to. And and the message of all of this is not like now you have to go and become the world famous musician, or as you said, that right. of such and such. Like Dorothy's just a regular girl, like in the middle of the Midwest of the U.S. somewhere, um, wanting to go home. And so the point is now, now you will achieve greatness. Right. And, you know, it, it's not. It's not that home is the state of greatness. It's that home is the state of home. <laughs> Those are very different things. Um, so when I talk about this unleashing our creative impulses and our desire to be together because we're all united in wanting to go home, um, yeah, it's not. It's not like now you should go become a, a world famous artist. It's it's just that you should tune into those aspects of yourself. Um, well, I okay, think you just right. answered that second question. I mean, oh, in a way, right? Because that's it. <laughs> that's the answer. It's like. It sounds like it. I'll obviously give you a chance to answer it again, but that's so beautiful that really, because you mentioned the word, you said this a couple minutes ago too, but you just said it again, which is, it's really about going home, whatever home looks like. And, and that's it. Like, and I'm curious as a follow-up to that, what does that mean? What does that feel like to you home? for all of us? And what does it feel like to you? Like, how would you describe what you mean by home? I, you know, the, that answer, there's a very fundamental answer to it, but um, I'd say there are also smaller, more temporal answers to it. I'll, and, uh, so let me just tell you like one story from earlier in my life. I don't, I'm not sure this is the answer I would give today, but, but I think it illustrates <laughs> what, what I'm talking about. Um, Okay, how do I, sort of a long story. I'm trying to think how to condense it. No, you don't worry, um, just, just say it, share it. We, we've editors, we, we can make it shorter. <laughs> okay, so back when I was a corporate lawyer, which was not what I really was meant to be doing, but I kind of liked it along the way. Um, I, I was very ambitious about it. I wanted to make partner. Um, I had this dream that, I would be able that once I made partner, I'd be able to um, live in one of these amazing, beautiful red brick Greenwich Village townhouses in Lower Manhattan that I Gorgeous. loved. And the reason yeah. I love them is because it's, this was like this neighborhood that, in the past, had been inhabited by artists and writers, and I felt at home there. So it was this great irony that I was like trying to make partner in a Wall Street right. law firm in order to live <laughs> in a neighborhood that had once been the center of art and literature. Um, but I wasn't disturbed by this irony. I was like aware of it, but it didn't bother me. It just went and did it. Okay. But then came the day 
that I, so I'd been like working 16 hour days um, for seven years straight. And then um, the senior partner like knocks on the door of my office and says, actually, you're not going to make partner after all. And my first impulse was to burst into tears. My second impulse was to uh, ask for a leave of absence. So I literally left the firm three hours later that very afternoon. But then after that, just a few weeks later, I ended a seven year relationship that had always felt wrong. And, and so now I was like floating around. I'm in my early thirties. I have no career suddenly. I don't have a love. I don't really have a place to live because I've moved out of where I've been living for the last seven years. Wow. So every, everything is like in free fall. Um, and, and I, and I, and I fall into this relationship with a guy who's not fully available for various reasons, but I really fall in love with him and it becomes this kind of crazy obsession. And he's a lyricist and a musician and a very lit up kind of person and you know becomes one of those obsessions we've all been there um, just to illustrate it this was like this was when I guess this was the early 90s so we had the internet then but we didn't have smartphones so I was like spending my days you know dodging into internet cafes on every block just to see if there was a new email from him like that's what it was like and and I had a friend, Naomi, and I would bore her, I'm sure, with endless stories on repeat all about this musician who I was now in love with. And one day, Naomi said to me, you know, if you're this obsessed with somebody, it's not only the person themselves, you're obsessed by something they represent. So you're longing for something, she said, what are you longing for? And I suddenly realized that this musician, he represented for me that world of art and literature that I wanted to be part of. And it was like he was an emissary from the perfect and beautiful world of home that I was longing for. That's what he was. He was an emissary from that world. And, and I, I realized this with a sudden clarity. And I know this sounds like too cinematic to believe, but the obsession fell away at that moment. And I really started writing for real at that time. And I still loved him, but I didn't like, it was no longer erotic or romantic and the obsession was gone. And it was like, I was now, I was now at home for that mm -hmm. period of time. Um, wow. so, That's so beautiful. Yeah. So I guess I, it, like that was a very dramatic episode of it in my life, but um, the real question is, you know, what what are you longing for, and why are you longing for it? Like to really ask yourself that question, because there's probably something in you that really needs to be in that place. Uh, I like it brought me to tears because I totally relate to that. And uh, there was a time, and my producer can edit this out because my audience has heard this. Al although she might think this is relevant, but I just want to share it with you because we're having such an intimate conversation. Um, and if we were having coffee, I would say, oh my gosh, me too. Da, da, da. So uh, there was a time where I went out to LA and I wanted to be a songwriter and I got a record deal actually. And then I got dropped and then I got another record deal. And I was like, this is what I'm doing. And then I got dropped again. So then I got like a day job. Anyway, there was like a moment two years into this day job working in like a corporate setting where I just, I didn't recognize myself. And uh I knew I had to, to leave. And when I left, I also broke up with somebody that I was dating. And um, I also gave away all of those double breasted suits and everything. And then I, <laughs> yeah. I started to just like feel more like myself. And I started going back into songwriting and I did find a way to actually become a composer for film and TV instead of, oh, wow. it wasn't like it was all or nothing. And then I, I had a really beautiful life for 10 years, um, which is actually why I started a podcast called Don't Keep Your Day Jobs so that you could find your life's work because there was something else. But what's interesting is my husband lived next door to me, but I didn't ever think of dating him and he never thought of dating me. And it was only when I stopped wearing these double-breasted suits and I broke up with this mm -hmm. other guy and I started to feel like myself and I started to write music that we actually saw each other, even though wow. we were next door neighbors. 
And um, it's just interesting, wow. like that I really relate to that. And I hope that if people are listening right now, not, not that I hope, I, I don't hope that you think it means that you have to break up with who you're with because that's not always the case. Um, but I do hope that if people are listening, that they could at least understand that there is another possibility for life, that you don't have to feel that what you really long for doesn't get to be who you get to be. And that if you can just show up and lean into to, to more of whatever that part of you is, that things will be revealed, you know, like the path will sort of open. And I'm so excited for you that you, so did you wind up moving into Greenwich Village? It, what what happened next? Oh, well, no. I mean, the other thing I realized is like, I didn't actually need to right. live in live. one of those houses. Although I did move to the Greenwich Village. I always wanted to live there and, um, and I did get an apartment there. <laughs> okay. um, and I actually wrote a lot of quiet at this amazing cafe right down the block in Greenwich Village. So yes, so some of that actually did come true. Just I didn't need the multi-million do million dollar house to do it. That yeah. was really the thing. It was more like, it wasn't, it wasn't about that. It was what the dream really had been about was, yeah. you know, like living the actual life that I wanted. Right. Um, so, and, and I, I do, I, like, I really want to emphasize that point because I do think the narrative we are sold in the movies or whatever is like, you know, follow your dream. And then you're going to be like, you're, you're going to be Diana Ross or, you know, you're going to be like the, the big um, multi-platinum CD selling person. And, and, and that's really not the point at all. It's not it's even not, what everybody wants. It's and like, it's not even what everybody wants, but it's like what you're told to want. Right. Um, it has like, to be an empire. Like whatever you exactly. want, it just be what, you know, what feels good. It has to be big. It's like very like Q Coca-Cola. It's like, it doesn't have to be that. It can be whatever it looks like for you. Just a feeling of fulfillment. Exactly. I, I, what just came to mind at this moment, as you were saying that is, um, a woman who uh, comes to my Facebook page a lot. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but I, I started this practice in the last year or two where on my social channels, almost every day I post a favorite piece of art um, and I'll then pair it with, you know, an idea or a, or a quote or a I didn't know that. I, I love that you do that. It's so cool. I really love it. I love doing it. It's like a daily practice. And, um, and it's, so it's attracted a lot of people to my page who, who love that kind of thing. What's the page? Art. Cause I'm definitely now going to want to, which, which, <laughs> what's the, is it just uh, Susan Cain Facebook? What is it? What is it? You know, I it's, you have to go to my author page, which I think is Susan Cain author. Okay. It's definitely. Okay. If you put in Susan Cain author Facebook, you'll find it. Okay. Um, but you have to go to my author page and not my personal one for that. Cause I don't really use my personal page. Um, and I do it on LinkedIn too, and Instagram by the way, but anyway, um, so because this is who comes to my page, there's a woman who comes, her name is Raisa and, um, and she's, she decided to take up painting in her fifties. And so she's constantly posting to my page, like watercolors and other paintings that she does. And it's amazing. Like they're great. And I love her and I love what she's doing. And she's not a world famous artist. I don't think she's a gallery or anything or anything like that, but she is living that life and she came to it so late in life. Um, and I will say like during all that whole time that I was a lawyer, I always used to collect the stories of people who first started writing when they were like 72. <laughs> I always found that really inspiring. Um, it's so inspiring. I, I had doc. I had Dr. Edith Eager on my show and she wrote two best-selling books, right? The Gift and the Choice in her late 80s, like oh in her God. 90s, like eight, like I think 90s really. Like I'm being generous to say she may have started them. How awesome. Wow. Like wow. Have you not read those two books, by the way? No, I have not. Susan Kane. <laughs> You're welcome. She's a, she's a Holocaust survivor who's also a therapist, who's also a walking gift. You have to read these books. You'll love. Oh, wow. Say wrote it again. The, the gift uh, and what was the other one? The choice. Yeah. Okay. It was on okay. Oprah's book club, you know, New York Times bestseller, blah, blah, blah. But like an unbelievable person who wrote those books in her 90s, didn't even become a therapist until her 40s, but then like became a nationally bestselling New York Times author in her 90s. Wow. I guess I'm saying yeah. that because a I, I thought you would appreciate her, but 
Totally. Also because why I do what I do. And of course then, you know, God is so good. We would meet each other. It's like, my whole thing is there are just things that you just feel like expressing, right? Like you just might want that the gift is in the expressing of it. It's not necessarily that it has to be that this thing gets sold at Sotheby's for whatever amount. It's like in the gift of just putting in the world, what you want to put in the world, you get a feeling of satisfaction that the outcome never even comes close to that, that feeling. And I love that you are a champion for people to feel what they feel, to express how they feel um, and to explore those sides of ourselves because that in of itself is the gift. Yeah. And to explore your sorrows and your longings, because that is actually that those are some of the greatest signs that you have of where you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to connect with and how. So don't listen to that aspect of our culture that's telling you not to go there. And my point is not to wallow in longing. And my point is not, it's certainly not to celebrate depression. Um, like I think one of the, one of the big, um, mistakes that psychology makes today is that we don't distinguish between depression and melancholy when in fact they are two completely different states. Right. Right. They are, they are. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. It's so true. You know, I'm not a, a, a psychotherapist, but it's like depression is a, it's its own thing. And then there are just the feelings that we feel in the thing called living a human experience and both of those things, right? Depression and living a human experience, they're, they're, they're both things that need to be loved and addressed and respected. But what we are talking about is like being here on this planet and adulting or whatever it is that we call this thing. Um, it's a, uh, it's serious business and to cut off a, a part of, of what it is to be here because we've labeled that as, you know, something that's taboo or something that we don't, it's, and it's interesting what you just said is that some, and I'm paraphrasing cause you just said it. I don't remember your exact quote, but you were saying like sometimes in that longing or the part of us that feels sorrow is in fact a clue of, of how you could maybe show up in the world. Maybe you're not saying this word, but I'm putting this word in there. Maybe even there's a sense of like purpose or a sense of how you're meant to gift the world with your, your own ex experience by looking at that part of you. Absolutely. And, and I also think that it helps us to manage and to cope when difficult times come to us. And that's going to happen to all of us, no matter how charmed a life we've led. But, um, you know, like to me, the, the definition of bittersweetness is the, the recognition that all of life is, um, is a pairing of joy and sorrow and light and dark. And that, that is what life is. And, and there's a kind of paradoxical thing that only when you truly accept that duality, can you transcend it? Um, but we are taught that the main path of life is when everything's going well, you know, you're healthy, the job is good, everything's good. That's the main path. And then when things don't go well, when difficult moments come, that's the detour from the main path. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that's not the detour. They're all the main path. Yeah. They go and together. They go together. And if we understand that all of that is the main path, um, that, that frees us from a lot of the resistance that we have when the bad things come. So, so well like, said. But like so much of the difficulty when bad things happen is like, no, it wasn't supposed to be like this, you know, like the ultimate why me. But instead of saying this is this is what life is and yeah, and it sucks. Like, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and make life different, I probably would, honestly. No, but, it's um, it's beautiful. But, but this is the life we have and we're all in it together. And yeah, that, that's the great connection. Last thing I'll say, and then we're going to wrap up, but it just, I don't know if I've ever shared this with my audience and, and it just strikes me as something to say, which is that at our wedding, um, and, and, and often people have seen Jewish weddings, like maybe in a movie and you, mm -hmm. people who are listening, you know, that there's like a breaking of a glass and then people say mazel tov. So I remember asking our rabbi, uh, why on earth do we break a glass? Like, and he goes, it's interesting. People don't usually ask. We just, you know, talk about <laughs> when it's going to happen in the ceremony, but it's a great question. Yeah. And I said, so what, so why do we do that? And he said, because the world is broken 
the world is not perfect. In fact, you know, one of the, the ideas in Judaism, for those of you who are listening, is that we as humans were created to help make it better, that each person has a gift, that we can hopefully put all these broken pieces back together, which is such a beautiful idea um, for humanity to think about being a partner in making the world better. But he said, right after your highest joy of getting married, it's right after you're actually married, the very first thing you do now that you're so, so, so blissful, let's hope, right? (laughs) Hopefully you're feeling that way, is you break a glass to remind yourself that even in your highest joy, to be mindful that the world is yet not whole Mm -hmm. and that in fact, hopefully the joy in being together, that the first step you take as husband and wife is that somehow together, maybe you'll help each other be more of who you are so that you will help this broken world. And I just thought that is like exactly a perfect example of what you're saying. It is a perfect, perfect example. Um, and I'll give you a permutation of it uh, that I actually end the book with or close to the end. Um, I talk about the Kabbalah, which is the, um, the mystical side of Judaism. And, and the idea from the Kabbalah, the metaphor is that all of creation was once an intact divine vessel, mm-hmm. um, but that it shattered. It's broken, as you just said. And So now we're living in this world where these divine shards are like scattered all around us in the mud. Um, And all we can really do, we can understand that brokenness and we can pick up those shards wherever we happen to find them. And the amazing thing is that the ones that you're going to notice sparkling there in the mud are different from the ones that I'm going to notice. You know, I might walk right by and might think it's just like a a piece of dirt and you see the shard and vice versa. Um, but that's what we do. We, we, we can, you know, we, we can go around and like pick up these pieces of beauty and, uh, yeah, I love I, that. I, I find that metaphor so helpful for like all the difficulties, especially of this, of this time right now. Yeah. And I also love it. It's kind of like, Uh, I know I just said eight different things that let you know that I'm very proudly Jewish, but my kids love all holidays. So sometimes like if there's an Easter egg hunt, like, you know, in a public place, like at a pumpkin patch or something, my kid, we, we go do it and they don't know the significance of it. Not that I'm against it. It's just, we don't celebrate Easter, but they love looking for these like hidden things, right? They just find it really fun. How fun is it that even with all the hard stuff that's going on, we can remind ourselves that there are these little moments where you like see the light in the midst of it all. And then you can go look, right. It's so beautiful. And that for each of us, like if you keep your eyes peeled, probably by the end of today, you'll find one of those pieces of light. You might find it in a stranger. You might find it in something beautiful that you see, you know, in nature, but you'll find it like it's there and it makes it all the more beautiful because it's not all that is right. It's sort of like a mixed bag and we can sort of notice the beauty even in whatever moment we're in, which is so lovely. Um, Susan, thank you so much for coming on and uh, tell everybody where they can buy the book and where they can follow along with you. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the book is basically available anywhere you buy your books and you can come to my website, which is susankane.net. And there it will also point you to all the different indie bookstores and so on where you can find it. So that's susankane.net. And I am also on all the different social channels, um, Susan Kane author on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And oh, I guess finally, I should say I, I, I Ted just released a new talk that I gave on bittersweetness. So you can find that too. It's called uh, The Hidden Power of Sad Songs and Rainy Days. Oh, that's a great title. Thank you, Susan Kane. I love talking to you. You're such a doll. Thank love you. talking to you too, Kathy. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.